All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Julie Zasada. I'm the Executive Director here at the Cedar Lake Historical Association. I want to welcome you this lovely afternoon um, at the lake to come and learn more about the Taylor family. So this is the last of the History Road shows for this season. Um, we did the Ball family and the Surprise family, and those have been uploaded to YouTube. Um, so you can watch those, and this will also be uploaded to YouTube. You can watch that one later as well. And then it is time to get ready for the 2022 season. We are less than one month away from opening day. Members only preview. Sunday, April 10th, 2 to 4, we'll take you down the hallway and show you what we've been working on and what all this mess is all about this past winter. Then Waterways, April 15th, is an amazing exhibit that we were um, blessed enough to be able to be um, selected to host through Indiana Humanities. It is a Smithsonian curated exhibit and it's all about our relationship to water and we're also going to have an extra piece of the exhibit that we develop locally to talk about Cedar Lake's water story and the dredging and all of those kinds of things. And then on May 7th we have our 101st anniversary celebration, uh, the anniversary of when this building opened as Lassen's Resort Hotel. We will also be christening a very special new member of the family named Baby Dewey. And I'm going to leave it at that, and we'll tell you more about that later. And then, the other thing I want to share with you, June 2nd, Steamer Dewey returns to Cedar Lake. So last year, if you were fortunate enough to come for a steamboat ride, um, the boat will be back this year, and not just for one week. We're hoping one day a week, all summer long. So in general, we're hoping to be here on the first and third Thursdays, and the second and fourth Wednesdays. And um, you'll be able to have lots of opportunities to have a ride. And I want to welcome again our visitors. Oh, let me leave it for one second. Welcome our visitors and our members. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. Um, I have an update as well about uh, Steamer Dewey. We're going to have four routes this year. So not just the one route that goes back and forth for the 20-minute ride. That's called the Monon route, and that route will be back. But we're also going to be doing a Southern Resorts route and a Northern Resorts route and a premium route where you go for 45 minutes around the lake. Um, so the cool part for our members is that the Southern Route, the Northern Route, and the Premium Route, those are going to be 20% off for you. So anyone who has a, a museum membership will be getting a discount on those, um, those excursions. And before I begin, I want to encourage you all to become involved. We have a lot going on, as you can see, um, in the beginning part just of the spring, all summer long, lots of things going on. I was recently interviewed about how did the pandemic affect volunteerism at the museum. So 2020 was rough, of course. Half of the crew was on, you know, hiatus, and we weren't able to do anything or come out and, and work. But in 2021, we rebounded amazingly, and we were able to have our best season ever in terms of visitorship, membership, volunteerism, and donations. So we're really, really excited about that. If you fall into one of those four categories, thank you for your support. And if you don't, let's figure out which category you fit into. I'd love to have you working with us to present another incredible season to our citizens and our tourists this coming year. So now for the Taylor family. And of course I'm modeling the Taylor Ice Truck t-shirt which is available in the gift shop today. Just see me after the presentation if you would like one. And you should have seen our girl out in front. Tim is our board member who is in charge. She's basically her uh, caretaker, if you will. And um, if you have any interest in helping um, Tim take care of either Baby Dewey or the Taylor Ice Truck, you're going to want to see him after the fact to talk about the Transportation Committee. And we would love to have you helping in that regard as well. So, and you can take them outside and show them around if they want to see the inside of the truck, toot the horn or anything like that. You can, sure. you can go outside with Tim yeah. afterward. Yeah. And our historian, Scott Bocock, has pulled together pretty much all of the information that I'll be talking about today. This is a big pioneer family, huge pioneer family. I have all the notes here with me. It's a, a stack like this big, so if you want to see anything, want more information after the presentation, I'm happy to help you. As I had mentioned before, the pioneer days approximately 1830 to 1870. But the Taylor family has lineage going much, much, much farther back. The Obadiah Taylor Descendants and Historical Association has extensive research. We're going to focus on this branch that you see kind of illustrated up on the screen. We're going to go from Obadiah down to Todd Taylor, who's the one that donated the ice truck. That's the specific uh, lineage that we're going to talk about today. But there's, again, so many family members. Let's start, though, with Obadiah. Um, as you can see, they were born in 1762. He was born on a large farm in Deerfield, Massachusetts, to Rochelle Sawtell and Adonijah Taylor. Both Adonijah and Rochelle's family are of Puritan stock, 
and Adonijah had a grist and a sawmill on his place, and it was uh, the, the name of their farm was called Indian Hill. Adonijah was a Minuteman in 1775 at the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which marched on the alarm of April 19, 1775. Later in the year of 1777, we even have records that indicate that Adonijah was a first lieutenant at Fort Ticonderoga. Obadiah's older brothers, Adonijah's other sons, John Edmund Eliphalet, Elephant, I don't know how to pronounce that name, and Solomon also served at Miniman in 1775. So finally at the age of 18, Obadiah enlisted in the Continental Army, and that is the muster roll that you see up there on the screen um, for the term of six months. He, it says on there, stature five foot eight inches, complexion dark, engaged for the town of Montague, arrived at Springfield July 9th, 1780, marched to camp July 10th, 1780, under the command of Captain Daniel Shays, and discharge January 9th, 1781. So again, Obadiah is our, that's whose picture, um, whose picture is up there on the screen. If any of you decide to get really involved in, in Taylor family research, you may encounter um, one article or one, one write-up by uh, uh, Daniel Burns, is he a family member? Yeah. Um, where he was like, oh, I don't think this is the right Obadiah because this is Obed on the, on the muster roll, that kind of thing. But it says Obadiah up top there. They crossed out, instead of saying residence of Montague, they crossed out, meaning the town he enlisted at was Montague, not necessarily his residence, which was 12 miles away in Deerfield. So there was a little bit of confusion through the years in the family, but we're, we're reasonably almost 100% certain that we have the correct Obadiah muster roll, all that good stuff. So Obadiah married a woman by the name of Abigail Williams of Deerfield, Massachusetts, about 1789. She was a descendant of Dr. Thomas Williams, Robert Williams, Major Elijah Williams, whose father was Reverend John Williams, who was captured by Indians. So you can see, big family, lots of kids. We don't have all the records necessarily, the different dates of birth and death and things like that, but this is the order that the children appear in the family records. So that's how we have them listed for you here. And obviously any of the women who married, I just put their, their married name on the, on, the, on the paper there. And you can see how Obadiah Jr. might have been a bachelor. We're not quite sure. So um, we did a little bit of extra work looking up some things. But this is, as far as we know, um, the best information we have about the family and, and the birth order. So lots of traveling. By 1800, um, let's see. So they were over in the Massachusetts area. By 1800, they were in Rensselaer County. Then they moved to Camden. Oneida County, New York, where Obadiah was documented as captain of the militia in 1805. Later, they moved to Crawford County, Pennsylvania, which is down here. Then they went up to Erie County, Pennsylvania. Then they were at Chautauqua County, which is in New York, by 1830. And 1830s, when we finally start to make our way out to um, Northwest Indiana, so to speak. Obadiah's son-in-law, Dr. Calvin Lilly, emigrated to St. Joseph County, Indiana, which is the dot right over here and settled at South Bend. Now, some sources say that Obadiah and Abigail went with their daughter, Elmira, to St. Joseph County about 1830, and that Abigail may have died then after this trip. In 1832, Obadiah and several of his sons and sons-in-laws, including Dr. Calvin Lilly, made their first trip to Lake County, Indiana. Liked it very much, went home, came, uh, prepared themselves to come back and settle on the east side of Cedar Lake in the spring of 1836. So that's the final dot with the red there, that's getting them all the way over to Cedar Lake here. Let me see. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to read an excerpt from a book called Lake County, Indiana, 1884. It's a summary of historical papers that Timothy Ball, if you remember from the first History Roadshow, was our first county historian, and um, he was the editor and publisher of this particular document. So I want to actually read some stuff verbatim here. So it says here, Then came members of a large family connection. These were Adonijah Taylor and Horace Taylor, two brothers, with wives and children, with two brothers-in-law, Calvin Lilly and Horace Edgerton, with their families and aged father, Obadiah Taylor. With the large Taylor family and its connections, East Cedar Lake is mainly identified. Dr. Calvin Lilly, who had been stopping for a year or two at South Bend and whose goods were brought in a good-sized rowboat down the Kankakee River, chose for his claim the northern portion of the east side. 
built his cabin near the top of the slope where it commanded full view of the broadest part of the lake, and opened a Pioneer Hotel and started a new country store. So I'm going to shift sources for one second. Now we're going to talk about the history of Lake County in 1929. It's, here's a little more specific description. In coming to Lake County in the spring of 1836, part of the journey was made in a large flat boat down the Kankakee River. A cook stove, the first to be brought to Lake County, was thrown into the Kankakee River when the boat struck a snag in the river channel, probably in the southern part of this county. The party of immigrants then proceeded to the falls of the Kankakee at Moments, Illinois and then took the old Indian trail from Moments to Cedar Lake. Dr. Calvin Lilly was the first physician and surgeon to locate in Lake County. And again, extensive notes from this family who has got so much information for us. I have so many details about the Lilly Inn in Tavern and the, the, the um, what was her name? Uh, Elmira? No, uh, Calvin's wife. Um, Lily, whatever, I can't think of her first name right now. Dorothy? Dorothy yeah, Lily? Yeah. So how Dorothy, you know, waited on different people and, and she helped him with his medical practice. Lots of information about that. But we're not going to reveal all that today. You can look at that, read that afterwards. We're going to talk about Horace now. So let's go back to our 1884 document. South of Dr. Lily, Horace Taylor made his claim and settled his family in 1836 on what is now the Stanley Place his claim taking in Cedar Point. So this is that map that we have in the resort room. Of course, says Coleman's Hotel in Kennedy's. That's about where Calvin Lilly settled. And then down here, Cedar Point, and then down just a little bit more, Stanley's Hotel. That's where Horace ended up having his first um, home built. So it says five large cedar trees were then growing on that wooded bank, of which but a few trees now remain. So I'm going to clarify a point before I continue reading this. In 1839, just a couple of years after getting him, Obadiah and Dr. Calvin Lee both died in that same year. They were buried in what was called West Point Cemetery, again, up in that area where it says Coleman's Hotel, on a bluff which no longer exists where the Sunset Harbor condominiums sit today, those bright, colorful condos. So it was just south of Kennedy's Hotel where they were buried. And this name, West Point, I want to explain it because it's going to come up again repeatedly. So Benjamin McCarty, a gentleman, bought land from Dr. Lilly. He called it West Point. What he was doing was he wanted, in 1840, to compete against Salone Robinson to locate the county seat here in Cedar Lake. Clearly he did not um, win in that regard. Um, he, he lost to Robinson. It says, not having been selected for the county seat because the fishing and milling interest proves insufficient as occupation for the dwellers beside the lake. So shortly thereafter, everyone took their stuff, left West Point, and decided to come down south, and I'll show you a different map down to Tinkerville. Um, so we'll explain that and then eventually Creston. But um, let's go back to this 1884 account for just one more quote. So after West Point was long abandoned, okay, this is being written in 1884, they abandoned West Point around 1840. Um, it says that West Point remains tenantless unto this time, pasture ground only, covered with trees, shrubs, and blackberry bushes. Little vestige remains of the earlier pioneer life that once was there. One of our first social centers where large households have gathered, where has been a voice of prayer and praise. There for life are only the birds, the rabbits, and the honeybees now. 50 years from a wilderness back to a wilderness again. The community, meaning those West Point settlers, the community has spread over that small portion of the once wild and beautiful Lake Prairie, now numbers more than 40 families. Among these are the great, great, great grandchildren of Obadiah Taylor, who again came here in 1836. In other words, those of us who have been here some less than 50 years have seen in this family line already six generations. The number of descendants of Obadiah Taylor now living in this county is a full hundred. Just keep that number in mind because it's about to blow up. Um, so Horace, who is up on the screen there, born in 1801 in Rensselaer County, New York. He married Sarah Ann O'Dell about 1819 in Crawford County, Pennsylvania. Again, extensive genealogical notes to take you through those years. We're, we're fast forwarding to 1832. So as I mentioned, in 1832, Horace, his father, several brothers come to explore Lake County to find a suitable place to stake their claim. After reaching Cedar Lake, they search no farther but return home to South Bend to prepare to move to Lake County. In 1836, Horace, Sarah, and their family in a covered wagon full of household goods pulled by two strong horses reach the eastern side of Cedar Lake along with the other Taylor relatives. 
They filed a claim in the timber on the eastern shore of Lake Point South. Horace built a large log cabin house near where Stanley's and then Enoch Peterson's house stood years later. In 1837, Horace was elected as Justice of the Peace at Center Township, which is this side of Cedar Lake. And sometime later, like I had mentioned, they all moved the family down on the prairie, down to an area that was, became known as Tinkerville, and eventually absorbed into Creston. Horace was a farmer by occupation. He continued to reside in Lake County per the 1840 federal census. Sarah died sometime between 1840 and early 1848. We don't have the exact date, at least not in the records that I had. And she's believed to be buried in an unmarked grave in the adjacent cemetery of the Baptist Church outside Preston, which is still there today. And if you remember, I believe Ball family members were also buried there. So on the 1850 federal census, Horace is shown to be living with his new wife, Martha, up in, where did it go? Martha Holly in Trenton, Dodge County, Wisconsin. And Horace's son, who I'm going to talk about in the middle, Sylvester, also resided next door with his wife, Lydia, in 1850. So, between 1849 and 1853, Horace, along with two of his sons, Obadiah G. and Alvin, catch the gold rush fever. They head out to California to find their fortunes. In 1853, Horace is reportedly murdered by an Indian who desired his fur hat. A Taylor family historian remembers, Horace started home with several thousand dollars worth of gold, but was killed on the way back in Indian Massacre. One son, Obadiah G., returned to Lake County, but son Alvin remained in the West. There is no stone marker at the Creston Taylor Family Cemetery for Horace. Martha's family descendants actually believe that Horace may be buried in Grays Lake, Lake County, Illinois, because that is apparently the, the area that they had come through on their way back. So to this day, we, we do not know where his, um, his grave site is located. So as I said, this is a picture of Horace with his second wife, um, Martha, and their two children that they had, two daughters. This other picture, um, in laid right here, we're not certain if it's Horace. It's in the family records, but it has Horace question mark. If you kind of look at it, the mouth seems to be um, shaped the same. The eyes, maybe, they're clearly heads are turned at a slightly different angle, but we put it in here, but I can't say for certain if that's Horace or not. So the next family member we're tracing is Sylvester. Sylvester Maxwell Taylor was born the third son to Horace and Sarah, so first wife, on May 29, 1825, in Erie County, Pennsylvania. Sylvester married Lydia Lucretia Odell in Chicago, Cook County, of course, December 28, 1844. And as I mentioned, we found them on the census records up in Wisconsin, living next door to Dad. But Sylvester moves back to Lake County before 1858, because his son, James H. Taylor, was born in Cedar Lake on June 20, 1858. So we know they came back by then. The 1860 federal census shows Sylvester is residing in Center Township, again, this east side of the lake. He's, it states that he's a farmer and his personal property worth $300. And then the federal census of 1870, Again, they're still living on the east side of Cedar Lake. They have real estate valued at $1,500 and personal property worth $300. Now, Lydia died in 1893, and then the 1900 census shows that Sylvester was widowed. Um, he's residing in District 33 North up in Lake County, and the next census in 1910 actually reports that he's living with his daughter Clara and son-in-law Fred Hessler in East Chicago. So I'm guessing maybe that's where they were living as well in, in 1900. Um, Sylvester Maxwell Taylor, he died December 23rd, 1910, at the age of 85 years old, and he is buried at the Crescent Cemetery down south of Cedar Lake here. So this fourth generation photo that you see up on the screen, so you have Sylvester in the bottom corner, his eldest son John, John's eldest son Hamlet, and then that little boy is um, John's grandson, what is his first name, Harry. Harry Wheeler, so um, John's daughter, Maude, that's Harry, um, the little boy's name is Harry. And then this is the, oh, what they did was, I guess in 18, 1934, they reprinted some other records from another um, edition of the newspaper, so this is actually a reprint, but it's a reprint of Sylvester's obituary, so I'll just read it for you guys here. It says, Sylvester Taylor, one of the first to arrive at Cedar Lake, died in East Chicago, at the home of his daughter Thursday, and the remains were brought to Preston on Christmas Day for burial. He was the last of the old tailors to go, and leaves one daughter and five sons. He was born in 1825 and was 85 years old last May. He spent a great majority of his life at Cedar Lake and Crown Point and moved to East Chicago several years ago. 
His sons are John of Griffith, Alfred of Cedar Lake, Horace, James, and Sylvester of this place. He is the last of the strictly first settlers who came to Cedar Lake, following close after Amasa Edgerton, whose death also ended that old tribe. So that's a reprint, like I said, of Sylvester's um, obituary. Oh, and these pictures. So that's Sylvester and his, Sylvester and his wife, Lydia. Um, we don't know when that was taken, though. I don't think the family records indicated when that picture would have been taken. Obviously, later, this was taken in 1904. He looks similar enough in age, so. I believe it was an anniversary picture. An anniversary picture? Okay, fantastic. So now we need a map break because you guys know how much I love maps if you've been coming to these presentations all year. I know it's hard for you to see. You're going to have to go home and watch this on YouTube so you can like really zoom in on all the different spots on the maps. But what this is showing is all the different places. So this is the Hardesty map, 1874. This is the Amos Ullman map, 1891. So all the different settlements that the, um, the Taylors had. So up in the very top, it says OG Taylor. Um, that is approximately where TJT Tire is located. That's that land up there. And then over here where it says DCT and William T kind of on the side, that's approximately where we think Horace had settled. And then down here at the south end, where it says OG Taylor, that is where Coffin Shady Beach was. Now it's those five um, uh, large homes at the south end of the lake. But that was that was Taylor land as well. And then you drop down here. Here's Tinkerville. When I was talking about Tinkerville, mm -hmm. so up. Well, I can't reach. I'm far too short. But anyway, up in the land at the top of Cedar Lake is where West Point was. They came all the way down here to Tinkerville. And then I think we'll have to look at the next map to see Creston in a second. So anyway, 1874, OG Taylor. I kind of did a zoom out because I couldn't fit it all. That's that whole land there that he owned. And then DC Taylor owned this land down here. So, so those are all the spots they had, you know, over, it's all is marked. Like this is 180 acres, 100, another parcel is 40. So several hundred acres were owned by the Taylor family. So that's 1874. In 1891, all the stars are in approximately the same locations. Um, and here now, by 1891, you see Creston is marked on the map right here. And so Tinkerville would have been in box two, which is more so over in this area. You can see it no, no longer exists by 1891. So that is where, like I said, most of the family ended up moving from West Point down to here. Next is Alfred G. Taylor, born February 29th, 1860 in Crown Point. He was the fourth of seven children born to Sylvester and Lydia. The 1880 census shows he was still living at home with his parents and four of his siblings at the time. He was listed as a laborer in that document. Then in 1890, we have census records destroyed by fire. So we have no records of any families. Um, there's only like partial for a couple of random states in the, in the entire country. Um, we do know from marriage records that he married Mary Kubish on January 2nd, 1885, and then the 1900 census shows him and Mary with four children at home. By 1910, they were still on their same farm, which I'll show you the map in a second. Their same farm, only two children at home at that point. 1920, just him and Mary at home on the farm. 1930, same place, and it lists the name of their street as the Concrete Highway, which is 133rd. Um, he's still a farmer by occupation. In 1940, him and Mary living on what is now known as Rural Route 1 Crown Point. So again, this is all 133rd. Um, that particular census, they made notations. So it says that the highest grade completed for both um, Alfred and Mary was fifth grade. And let's see, Alfred preceded Mary in death. She lived um, to be 100 years old. She died in 1965. So we just, all I know is that Alfred died before um, 1965. So picture Alfred and Mary right here. And then I'm going to do my best to point out who's who here. So Mary Baker Taylor is the one in the uh, back left corner. Emma Stilson, who is the older woman next to her. She, Stilson is another one of those family names, if you remember from the other slide. Um, Barbara Novak Taylor holding baby Judy. Then we have Harry Taylor with the hat on in the back row, and next to him in his um, uniform is Thomas Jefferson Taylor, Jr. Then in this middle row behind this lady right here with a face half block, Irene Taylor Sayer. Then Alfred right there in the middle with his hat and his looking same, he's got the same mustache from this <laughs> earlier picture. Carl Sayer, which I assume is Irene's husband. Then Dorothy King Taylor and Thomas J. Taylor, Sr. 
So just to give you a frame of reference here, so Barb, Barbara, no, Barbara up there holding baby Judy is Tom Sr.'s wife here. Yes, Barbara and him. And then Harry, the guy with the hat in the back, is Tom Sr.'s son. Irene was Tom Sr.'s daughter, and Dorothy is Tom Jr.'s wife. So you'll see them on the next slide here in a second. But we have another map break. So this map was drawn by Harry, the gentleman I pointed out in the last picture. Um, what he did was just, you know, wrote down all of the different sites of all the different family um, farms and their homes. And it even says here um, where Harry was born, right here, and another one that says Tom was born here, 1886. So this street right here is the concrete highway that became Rural Route 1 that became 133rd, right there. And see this spot right there? West Point Cemetery, that's the site of it. There was a big bluff. I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. And then he put in here where the Indian trails were at. He goes to mention the first commercial ice house being built, which was Armors, which, as you know, the back half of our building came from the Armor Boarding House. And where Timothy Ball was born and raised on the other side of the lake, which you learned about that in our other History Road show. And um, a lot of the Taylor family, they had a, a, a mill at the outlet, at the Cedar Creek outlets. Um, so other home sites are all noted on here. So these, like I said, are, are Harry's Recollections. Here's Tinkerville down here, and then Creston right there, the swamp at the bottom end of the lake. So that's Harry's little, little map. Um, he lists Kubish, but he spells it differently. The marriage certificate spells it C-O-U, so that's what I ended up leaving in the presentation. So now for Thomas Jefferson Taylor Sr., born to Alfred and Mary on September 23, 1886. He married Barbara Novak on April 10, 1907. Um, the October 11, 1907 birth certificate IRE lists him as a laborer. And then on the 1910 census, he is listed as doing odd jobs as a wage earner. The June 5th, 1917 draft card that we have up there notes him as tall, slender, blue eyes, brown hair, not bald, and in no way disabled or deformed. He's married with two children. At that time, he was employed as a laborer for John Nelson, who we know to be the superintendent of the Knickerbocker Ice Company at the south end of the lake. And the 1920 census also lists that he was a laborer. Irene and son Harry, who was age eight at the time, were both at home with them. Uh, 1922, he starts the Taylor Ice Company. You see that's actually a later photo because that's his 1937 International, which is not to be confused with the one we have sitting outside, which is the 1947. Uh, but he did start that business in 1922 and made deliveries to residents and businesses all throughout the Cedar Lake area. The February 1923 birth certificate of Tom Jr. lists his occupation as farmer. The 1930 census, he's a farmer, again, living on the concrete highway with Barbara. They were both age 43 at the time, and their two sons, Tom Jr. and Harry, were at home. The 1940 census has them living again on that concrete road. This time, his occupation was listed as ice route. So I think he was doing the farmer and the ice route uh, the whole time. And it says on that particular census, so 1940, hours work per week was 24 on that ice route. So I'm guessing farming took up the rest of his time. Um, Tom Jr. is 17 at that point, still at home, and this is the one that listed their highest level of education. So both Tom and Barbara put on there that eighth grade was their highest um, grade that they made it to. And then his 1942 World War II draft card shows his occupation as farmer and peddled ice, which makes it super cute. Again, living on Rural Route 1 at the time, their telephone exchange was Cedar Lake 3522. And let's see, Barbara passed away on April 12, 1955, and Tom Sr. died May 9, 1976. So again, on his death certificate, his um, occupation was listed as Iceman. So that's very cool. That's the legacy we have to preserve for them. Um, so when you go in room 7, you will see two pieces of the back of his truck bed there. We have two pieces that are preserved up on the wall. And then um, I inlaid a picture of Barbara and, and uh, Tom Sr. together. This, that's the only picture I had of them, so that's through that in there from the other page. Um, and then there he is delivering ice. It's Tom Sr. Uh, let's see. Sectional map. So this one shows, I don't have a date, I think 1930s-ish, 
Um, but what I want to show you here, so here's that Crown Point Road, which later becomes 133rd. This is listed as Parkway, but it's really um, Morse right here. And then you go around the Lakeshore Drive. So right here is Coleman's Corner, this little spot here. This is where the um, West Point Cemetery was at. Here, Alfred Taylor owns all of this. Tom Taylor owns this 25 acres here. So I believe TJT sits at this corner, TGT Tire, and then their house is just a little bit next door to that. And then this is Fairbanks that would go up to Boys and Girls Club, which we'll be talking about in one moment. And so there's the, the Taylor family home that, that was built by Tom Sr. in 1919. And then here's a Google Earth bottom picture where you can see they closed in the porch, added on an extra little breezeway area and all that. But um, this is where this is where the ice man was um, resided. And let's see, anything else on that one? Nope, one last biography to cover, and that's Thomas Jefferson Taylor Jr., who was born to Tom Sr. and Barbara on February 1st, 1923. Now, as noted, we talked about this before, he would be living at home with his parents in 1930. He was only seven years old. Also at home in 1940 census, he was in his second year of high school at that point. He married Dorothy Keene on December 17th, 1941. And then we have his 1942 draft card there on the screen. Shows that he was employed at American Bridge Company in Gary. And through the years, we also know that he worked with his father operating the Taylor Ice Company as well. And let's see, Tom Jr. and his son Todd made their final ice delivery to the Lake County Fairgrounds in 1988. So a little excerpt from Tom's obituary. Um, Thomas Jr., age 87, of Cedar Lake, passed away Monday, December 27, 2010. He is survived by his wife of 69 years, Dorothy, one daughter, uh, two sons, 10 grandchildren, 14 great-grandchildren, one great-great-grandchild. He was a member of Trinity Lutheran Church in Crown Point, the American Legion, Post 261 in Cedar Lake, and AMVETS. He was a U.S. Army veteran serving in World War II, retired from TJT General Tire Service, was a Cedar Lake Iceman as a young man, and a Crown Point Community School bus driver for 26 years. And I'm told around the community a lot of people remember him being their bus driver. Um, and then he also operated Taylor's Mobile Service. It says, Thomas enjoyed life and hard work and truly enjoyed doing things like gardening on his 25-acre piece of ground. So we have a picture of Tom and Dorothy. I just gave you a face, a front face shot of Dorothy up there in the corner from that other picture. I'm guessing this photograph might even have been taken on that same day that that family photograph was taken. And here he is with two of his granddaughters, and I believe this was at their anniversary this picture was taken. So that is Thomas Jefferson Jr. And here, of course, we have a few pictures of our girl, the Taylor Ice Truck. And you see Todd right here, and there, and there. So Todd is featured here. I didn't go into biography about Todd, but he obviously holds a very special place in our heart because he is the one who called me up one day in June of 2010 and says, hey, I got this truck in the barn. Are you interested? And I'm like, Yes, I am. Tell me more. So um, we were very, very excited to uh, receive that donation in September. And then one month afterwards, on October 24th, 2020, we had her dedication ceremony out here in front. And um, we, you can see on that picture there where the truck is on, beginning, just got pulled out of the barn, um, nothing on the doors. But we were very blessed and fortunate to know a gentleman who is sitting in the room here today. Raise your hand, please. Custom, Bob Honick custom designed this logo for us based on Tom Jr.'s signature. So we basically looked at that chalk. There's a piece missing, the fact of what family actually operated the company. And so he, um, he took that and created this beautiful, gorgeous logo that's also featured on the back of the t-shirts um, so that we would be able to have, truly turn her into a mobile ambassador, but honor her, honor her heritage. Um, all right, next thing I want to talk about just a little bit, Obadiah Taylor Descendants and Historical Association. This family, like I said, a very unique pioneer family in that they decided to, to form their own association to keep this family organized and detailed. It's really interesting. So an organization of the descendants of Obadiah Taylor was formed at a meeting held at the home of Mrs. Flora Cutler in Creston on August 22, 1926. And arrangements were made to hold annual meetings in the fairgrounds at Crown Point thereafter. 
So that little nugget comes out of our 1929 history of Lake County. And then by 1939, they were meeting at the auditorium of the new Cedar Lake Schoolhouse in Creston. In earlier days, some of their midwinter meetings were taking place in the Lowell Public Library. But I want to read this letter. This is from the third year that they gathered. And just kind of, I'll read some of it. I won't read all of it. It says, Dear fellow member, you as a descendant of Obadiah Taylor of Deerfield, Massachusetts, are urged to attend the third annual homecoming and reunion of our association, which will be held in the Fine Arts Hall at the Lake County Fairgrounds at Crown Point, Sunday, August 5th, 1928. Registration will begin promptly at 10 a.m. Standard Time. Please bring well-filled baskets and enough dishes for your own family and share in the potluck dinner which will be served on the tables in the Fine Arts Hall at 12 o'clock Standard Time. In the afternoon, a program will be rendered under the direction of the program committee. Be sure to attend this meeting and make this the most successful one we have held. You are requested to fill out the enclosed blank, giving us all the data you can, and return the same to the historical secretary, Arthur G. Taylor of Crown Point. We are very anxious to have this information, for we are trying to compile a complete record of approximately 1,000 descendants of Obadiah Taylor. So that's just three years after this organization started meeting. So, and they go on to explain how they're connected to Obadiah and stuff. It's really, it's really cute. So we hope to have something of interest to announce at the meeting. Sincerely yours, William Taylor, President and Floyd Vintage Secretary. So again, um, what I am told from some of the family members who've been to these picnics that they used to have, there were like, I don't know if there were prizes, but there were definitely recognition given out for the oldest member present, the youngest member present, longest married couple, the couple that had the most children. Um, it's, it sounds like it was a, a whole big to do for this family. And do you still meet? Yes. Yes. First Sunday in August. First Sunday of August, all these years later, still having their meetings. So it's wonderful. And that's down in Lowell where they have those meetings. Um, there's also an Obadiah chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and they're about to become very significant in our story with this whole West Point Cemetery. Um, let me see. I'm going to leave that screen up because I'm going to talk about something here in one second. That picture, by the way, is from a 1950 reunion. So there were many to choose from. I just chose that one. Um, and you can, just, you can see how large the gathering that was. So extensive drama ensued with this whole Old West Point Cemetery, okay? Um, where Obadiah and Calvin Lilly were laid to rest all the way back in 1839, as well as some other family members. So I'm gonna read some different newspaper articles. In 1926, the Obadiah Taylor Descendants Association found the location of the Old West Point Cemetery on the Kennedy property. So here's that map, here's Barbara Kennedy's property, here's where 133rd comes in, here's Morse. So the cemetery was located right there, like I said, um, by that bluff on the hill. And it was reported that the land was subdivided and sold for home sites. A committee was appointed to cooperate with the DR and the American Legion of Lowell to purchase the land. So, 1929, so fast forward just three years. The grave, marked by a wooden marker, was kept intact on the east side of Cedar Lake when modern construction forced the demolition of part of an old cemetery there some years ago. The plan of the descendants of the Taylors is to have Lake County buy the territory surrounding the grave and make it a park, according to Ms. Ethel Vintage, Secretary of the Descendants Organization. All right, so this is 1929. June of 1937. The Families Association convened to dedicate a marker in memory of Obadiah Taylor at the junction of the Crown Point Cedar Lake and Cedar Lake Lowell Roads, which is Cedar Lake Lowell, Lowell and Crown Point Cedar Lake going that way. So they put a marker, they had music, a talk by Judge Arthur G. Taylor and Lieutenant Governor Henley Schricker of Indianapolis. So that was 1937. Then in June of 1941, the Lake County chapters of the DAR were honoring Obadiah Taylor's memory again with the unveiling and dedication of a boulder and a plaque marking the place where he is buried. So again, this was near Coleman's Corners, which is this right here where the um, True Valley is located. And, okay, now we gotta fast forward even more, 1950s. They're still trying to get this issue resolved. The DAR records note that the marker at the West Point Cemetery <clears throat> excuse me, the marker was placed at the West Point Cemetery, the original gravestones disappeared because the land became more valuable for business than a cemetery. Either the county commissioners or the township trustee, or both, condemned the area as a cemetery and allowed the gravestones to be thrown over the bluff and into the lake, which to me is horrific, and then permitted businesses to build on the site. So that's 1950s, okay? 1961. 
we're still trying to work through all this. Plans were made to move the old West Point Cemetery from its original site to a new one. The Pioneer Cemetery was a 30 by 60 foot burial ground located in the original land grant of Dr. Calvin Lilly, son-in-law of Obadiah Taylor. Lilly and Taylor, as I had mentioned, were buried there, including seven others, many who were family members. So this is what the area used to look like over where the colorful condos, the Sunset Harbor condos are located. So these are the bluffs. And this is, you would be standing here like by the street side and then the lake was on the other side of the bluff. I believe that's the Capers Cottage because the Capers, uh, was it the Capers or was it the Cubals? Maybe the Cubals Cottage. Um, and then here is, I think sticking out right here, when they were de demolishing the bluff, this is like in the 70s or something, they found a grave that they had missed. All right, so anyway, this is, let, me, let me back up. Let's go back to 1961, October 10th. Sometime during the first part of this century, a township trustee who had care of the cemetery sold it to Mr. Kennedy, who owned adjacent property. He refused to make amends to descendants when they discovered what had happened. In 1961, Jim Kubel purchased the property and was very cooperative about the cemetery and its removal to a permanent location. Um, Kubel was making improvements to the property and may have to excavate the cemetery. Two sites for the removal of the cemetery were offered. The first location was one quarter of a mile due east of the present location, is in the original town of West Point. It would be donated by Tom Taylor on Alfred Taylor's land, which I showed you in that other map. Or the second site would be a quarter mile north of the first, would be donated by Tom Jr.'s brother. Tom Jr.'s brother Harry. That second site is actually the one that they chose on Fairbanks across from the Boys and Girls Club. It says, we shall encounter the expenses involved in excavating and moving the graves or remains of graves from the original cemetery. Also the cost of placing fill or sod to cover it. Later, perhaps we can place a suitable marker for Obadiah Taylor, Revolutionary War Soldier. We have had the old cemetery surveyed and preliminary planning work is done. Now we are ready to excavate and remove the graves. So that was 1961 and then it's my understanding in the 70s, when the Cubals wanted to actually take down the bluff, they found one more coffin that had not been removed in the 60s. Um, and they had to also then remove that one. Um, and then Alan Miller, president of the Obadiah Taylor Descendants Association, was asking descendants to make financial contributions towards moving that West Point Cemetery. So the present day site, if you go up Fairbanks, um, across the street from Boys and Girls Club, just a little bit at the corner of 131st Avenue, you see this little area here, which that's the headstone, marking all of the descendants who were buried. And then, do you know, was this the stone that was placed at the corner and then eventually moved over to here? Yes, I yeah. think so. Yeah, so when I was mentioning how the DAR was putting that marker in, we do believe this to then be the marker that, that they were referring to, and it got moved as well when they relocated the cemetery. So in 1963, the Obadiah Taylor chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution accepted the deed to the new West Point burial ground of Obadiah Taylor on Fairbanks. Later, all of the remains from the West Point Cemetery were moved to former Taylor property across the street from the Boys and Girls Club. And then this plaque, they put a new plaque on in May of 2012. So when you are driving on 133rd and you look like you're going to turn left to Fairbanks, you'll even see it has a road sign that says, I think, Honorary Obadiah Taylor Way. So um, that's how you know, how do you know to find your way there. So does the family take care of this plot or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the um, presentation portion of our afternoon. What I'm going to do, like I said, as always, is stop the recording and give anyone in the room here a chance to share uh, family memories. But I want to thank you all for coming out. I hope, like I said, that you'll, you'll become more involved with us this year, help us pull off some of our different programs. Uh, and Tim is here, um, the handler of the Taylor Ice Truck, and we'll be happy to show you the truck after we dismiss if you want to want to see that and um, we would love to have you join the transportation committee if you want to help take care of her with us. Um, brakes are good? Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 oh gosh. All right, we're not going driving anywhere just yet this not year. Here, yeah. Not yet, not yet. We're working on it, but she runs. She runs and um, she's a darn little truck. So um, thank you so much you guys for coming out today. Thank you.